you know, there's also even, you know, marijuana in, in Binga, you know. You, 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 you can make a lot of profit out of that. Uh, President Chiu, you, you want know, to make the citizens high. I'm not saying you should smoke, <laughs> you know, but I'm saying uh, there is a lot of profit internationally if we are to tape into these local, you know, economies. Enhance that is what enhances the capabilities of our people. Wherever there's a people, there is commerce, there is business, there is activity, economic activity, and we must harness that and make sure that we build international brands out of it. Made in Zimbabwe, proudly Zimbabwe, we can do it. Look at Mazoe, you know, one of the best, you know, orange drinks. Mm. But look, what are we doing? Mm. It must be a global brand. Absolutely. But it's how we do it. Tanganda, mm. you know, Katio, you name it. Mm. So yes, the rural areas are our focus. And that is going to be our biggest issue. Not ruralizing the urban areas, yes. but urbanizing the rural areas. areas. Thank you. You know, balls have come into the urban areas. We want to chase them away mm -hmm. and make sure that even in the rural areas, water is also piped. There's tap water. It's possible. They've done it in in Botswana. Absolutely. They've done it in Rwanda. Mm. But it starts with understanding that policy making has to be done at a micro level. Look at what President Kagame is doing. Budgeting is done at a village level. Mm. That's where the priorities are. That's where people can monitor. That's where people can actually cause leadership, government, MPs to account. So rural is golden. And we are going to make sure that rural areas have the pride of place in terms of policy priorities. Thank you, Mr. President. And on the subject of people, allow me to segue into the rights of women. Now, women make up more than 51% of the Zimbabwean population, yet their level of participation in the political space does not reflect this or their important contribution towards society. What will the citizen movement do to ensure that more women participate in politics? Well, a number of interventions. Some legal, some political, but of course some cultural, mm. uh, some educational. Uh, but just to keep it all, we have to make sure that we restore the dignity of women at the family level, mm. the role of women. You know, you, you educate a man, you educate a person. Mm. You educate a woman, you educate a nation. Indeed. And it's important for us to target women in terms of uplifting them in opportunities, mm. starting at the micro level. Mm. If you go, most of the religions are peripherizing or marginalizing the girl child because of the beliefs, because of the culture. So we need to retrench all those cultures so that we are able to have a new thinking. And that's why we need a transformation of culture, a transformation of values at a family level so that we also know that there has to be equity, fairness and equality between the women you know, and the man, the girl child and the, the boy child at educational level opportunities. That is the starting point. But more fundamentally, we also have to look at the inheritance laws. They are weird, they are bizarre. I've been a lawyer representing, you know, women in cases where marriages have broken down. Women get a raw deal. We need a fundamental transformation so that we restore that dignity of women at that level from a lawmaking point of view. But more fundamentally, you know, we have to also look at SIDO uh, and other instruments mm -hmm. that promote gender equity mm -hmm. so that we are aligned, even the sustainable goals, so that we are able to then do what has to be done for women. But in politics, we have to lower the threshold of hazard and risk. Mm -hmm. You know that, uh, Fazi, you have been abused mm -hmm. so many times. Mm -hmm. You know, when they see Fazi, they see somebody who is looking for men. Mm -hmm. They even begin to give you men. Mm. But if a man is to also be in your position, mm -hmm. they don't do the same. Yes. They don't bastardize, demonize, mm. you know, those who are active at your level. Mm -hmm. So we have to move from these stereotypes. It's societal stereotypes mm -hmm. that we have to deal with. So that we have more women being able to step forward. We remove the gender stereotypes. Those who are in politics are in politics to save a nation mm -hmm. and to develop a nation. That is what we must deal with. Mm -hmm. So I've said different interventions have to be put in place, but also some kind of uh, an affirmative action. Yes. Not in a cherry sense, mm. but also in a clear sense to say, let's have more leaders who are women to represent, you know, uh, uh, female leaders.
Thank you. You know, and that is how we are going to have a multi-sectoral intervention to make sure that women um, are part of are the included. decision making. And so, will the citizen movement have a gender parity policy? Indeed. In fact, we want. We are considering because we are still working on the constitution, other institutions, our policies, our programs. Of course, we've refined on the values. At the appropriate time, we'll share our dream, our promise, and once we have launched. Uh, but we are also thinking of you know, doing away with the old structures that speak to the Women's League, the Women's Assembly. Let's just have uh, women and men you know, in a political party structure so that we have a 50-50 parity and there is no uh, marginalization of, uh, of women. Because what marginalization begins with this approach of being seen as if we have a separate, you know, bifurcated or a lager mentality, uh, you know, balkanized approach to promoting uh, the uh, case of women. You know, what we have to deal with ultimately is equality uh, of all uh, or different gender. Now, Mr. President, on the subject of marginalization, the Gukurahundi genocide remains unresolved and many citizens in various parts and provinces of the country feel excluded from the economy and from society generally. What do you believe needs to be done to unite the citizens? It's a fundamental national question. Historical injustices cannot be resolved by sweeping them under the carpet. Mm. We need to make sure that we place all our skeletons out of the cupboards and place them on the table, not for vindictive purposes, not for retributive uh, you know, justice or, or, or vengeance, but to make sure that we have rehabilitative and restitutive, restitutive justice, and making sure that we restitute those who suffered, but we are also very open about it. Uh, and you know that perpetrators can be uh, the solution to this problem. Uh, there has to be truth-telling, there has to be accountability, but it has to be a bottom-up approach, not a top-down approach. Let's engage communities, let's have community leaders, traditional leaders, you know, members of the clergy, pastors mm -hmm. in the various communities mm -hmm. in Matebeland or all the areas where there's been uh, this kind of a problem. Mm -hmm. Acknowledge that it was a genocide. Mm -hmm. Acknowledge that it's something that is undesirable mm -hmm. going forward. Because, you know, acknowledgement uh, is part of the healing, mm -hmm. but it's also part of the repentance. If you don't acknowledge your sins, you can never repent because otherwise sinning becomes a fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to avoid. Uh, this whole thing of trying to bury things, doing it secretly or nicodemously. Mm. So let's approach this elephant in the living room openly mm. and say what happened. Truth telling, reconciliation, draw a line in the sand, this far and no further, so that we don't repeat problems and mistakes of the past. Thank you, Mr. President. Now, on that subject of wrongs that have been done uh, against the citizens, we have the big fat elephant in the room, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission. Now, as we march to what you describe as a historic 2023 election, what steps has the Citizen Coalition for Change taken so far to hold ZEC to account, especially as regards the tainted voters' role? <laughs> ZEC must not be Zimbabwe election criminals, but Zimbabwe Electoral Commission. Yes. <laughs> that is independent, mm. that is accountable, mm. that is impartial, that does not, a referee who doesn't throw the whistle away to join the other team. Like we see, they do the bidding for ZANU, mm. they don't understand that the Z in Z does not mean ZANU, mm. it's Zimbabwe. Mm. And Zimbabwe is bigger than a political party. We are all Zimbabweans, mm. there must be a fair referee. In fact, they hold the keys to stability in this country. If they don't treat this issue of elections in a free fair manner, they are setting this country on a path of instability. Mm. So yes, they have to be professional, they have to be accountable, but we must also audit mm. the commissioners and their uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. You know, some have received farms, mm -hmm. some have received certain trinkets, mm -hmm. they are also getting certain benefits that make them unable. Once you are corrupted by receiving certain trinkets, mm. you can't think and act professionally. Mm. So that has to be dealt with so that the professionalism and independence of the commissioners is enhanced. But also, you know, have to look at the technical stuff. Mm. Some of them are still serving in government. Mm -hmm. So we have an audit of all those so that they are particularly 
very independent. We are already doing that. Right. We also commissioned experts to start to look into the waters for, and we have exposed uh, you know, some of the anomalies that we are seeing. Uh, and of course, we are going to act on them politically and legally, and we have even mass action uh, and political action to make sure that we have recourse and there's a fair election. We don't want rigged elections because they also produce rigged policies. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that you mentioned in your citizen agenda address uh, refer, relates to Zimbabwe's rank in the anti-corruption or corruption index. Uh, you indicated that Zimbabwe ranks 157 out of 180 in the world's corruption per perceptions index. And also, according to ZEC, at least two billion is lost to corruption and illicit financial flows every year. A hundred million US dollars is lost month monthly to uh, gold smuggling. Now, this is money that obviously could be used to fix schools, roads, and hospitals. What must be done to make the fight against corruption effective? A fish rots from the head. It starts with the leaders. The character of any nation is usually the character of his leader. The character of any family is usually the character of the head of that family. So if you go to any institution, if you just want to understand who is at the helm, just look at the behavior of that institution mm -hmm. or the culture of that institution. So it all starts with the leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, the tone is set at the leadership level. You know, you can't tell others not to be corrupt when you make it your daily bread mm -hmm. and your fashionable daily diet. You know? So it's important for the leadership to saw the difference and to act decisively. You know, one thing about corruption is that corruption does not come like a giant elephant. It comes like a little fly, like mm. a mosquito. Mm. And before you know it, it has visited you mm. in small you know, bribes, mm. and it becomes a, an elephant in the living room. Mm. <laughs> and you want to deal with it, it deals with you. Mm. So you have to deal with corruption at the very basic of stages. And it starts with the leadership. That's the first one. But number two, there has to be very stiff penalties. Mm. I don't understand why somebody would be corrupt, they go to jail, they're given bail. Mm. But somebody who steals a, you know, a beast, cattle, you know, yes. that is almost nine, you yes. know, mandatory. mandatory. And that's what we must make. Mm. People must be hanged mm. if they steal public money. Mm. Because you are not just stealing. You are stealing a country. You are mm. stealing a generation. You are stealing a future. Mm. And you must be dealt with as such. Mm -hmm. And that is the tough leadership we are going to provide. No stealing, no stick fingers, and no appetite that is ungoverned. No galloping greedness. We have to live within our own means. If you are a servant of the people, it's not about the self. It's about others. It's about service. It's about making... Why should you have the most expensive cars being driven by people who are in government? And yet people in the corporates do not drive such cars. This takes pay money. We just have to give you a wheelbarrow to transport you from one place to another. Why do you need an expensive car? You are not a Mbinga. Why do you want to be uh, like, uh, I don't know who the Mbingas are now. <laughs> I used to know Jinimbi. So, <laughs> you God know, bless his soul. Uh, you know, so, so yeah, we, we have to make that distinction. Yes. But it's a leadership ethic. It's transformation of values. Right. It's reformation of manners. In fact, change of government is not just change of personalities. You can remove Munangagwa, you put Chamisa. If you have not changed the culture and the values, you have not done anything. Mm. Because what you are simply doing is to change the appetite mm. of those who are greed. You have one greed politician, the another, another one coming. It doesn't change a country. Mm. So we have to change values. And it has to be the ultimate answer to dealing with corruption. But also stiff penalties. Mm. Look at what they do in China. Mm. You know, you go to other countries, they actually write by the airport to mm. say that if you have this gift in, in wanting to ask for state resources uh, secretly, please go back because you'll be punished heavily. That should be the way. Here in Zimbabwe, we have to draw a line in the sand. Heads right. have to roll. Thank you. Now, Mr. President, the last question I'm going to ask before I open it up to our live audience is about business and transformation. Now, Mr. Mnangagwa promised to open Zimbabwe for business. All indicators show that he has failed. What is the movement doing or going to do to gain the support?
support and trust of the business community? Business, the business community ultimately has to be at the center of decision making. Mm -hmm. you, you can't make these decisions on behalf of the business. Um, Mr. Mnangagwa promised that Zimbabwe will be open for business, but you know people have to pay bribes in order for them to have access. And it has been said by MPs, by people even from ZANU-PF mm -hmm. itself, uh, it shows you that there's a fundamental problem. What we need going forward is to engage the business sector to do what they know best, which is to be in business. Mm -hmm. And all we have to do is create a conducive atmosphere. Look at Lee Kuan Yew, how he transformed Singapore. Mm -hmm. He had to create a team and an army of business people who understood the vision that the political leadership was articulating. Look at Matt in, in Malaysia. That's how it is done. Mm -hmm. You know, Roosevelt in the United States of America, mm -hmm. uh, Churchill, even Thatcher, mm -hmm. Tony Blair, mm -hmm. you need a core group of business people to create an environment and not fight business mm -hmm. and not undermine business through incons you know, inconsistent, uh, inconsistent policy. policies mm -hmm. or um, contradictory policies. Mm -hmm. You look at the monetary policy, people don't know what the monetary policy is going to mm -hmm. be. Uh, look at the fiscal policy, the budget, you can't even predict. There's no predictability and consistency. That is how we are going to at least bring sanity into the business uh, community. Of course, investment is going to be a big issue, mm. but people want security mm. of their investment. Nobody is going to invest when their they you know, property is going to be stolen away, or so money destroyed uh, mm. without any recourse. But also the rule of law. Mm. We need an independent judiciary mm. where you know that if there is a dispute, a commercial dispute, adjudication is going to give you fair value. Yeah. And swiftly. Indeed. So those are the things to be dealt with. And of course, uh, business people know that we are good for business. And they know that when we then come into government, this country is going to boom. I can tell you that Zimbabwe is the next big thing on the continent mm. once we take over. Look and watch the space. 2023 is a big year, not just for business, for everyone. Because you see, we don't create jobs mm. as politicians but we create a conducive environment yeah. for jobs to be created by those in business. In that way, of course, government then uh, is able to unleash the fullest of potential for business, for workers, for the citizens, and of course, for consumers. Thank you. Now, I'm just going to open the floor up to our audience. If you've got a question, put your hand up. These are the kind of young people that I love who are all eager to ask. I'll start with a lady, if you can please assist her with the mic. Thank you. My question will be directed to His Excellency. I'm the current Gender Secretary at the National Gender and Welfare at Zinasu. So I speak on behalf of the largest constituency in Zimbabwe, which is the feminine domain. I hear that His Excellency pledging support and pledging to outline gender parity policies. My question, Your Excellency, is when does this begin? We were devastated in the past election, and now, after today, after you've, after you've outlined your vision, we would want to know, as the largest constituency, when do these promises start to take effect? Do we wait for 2023 elections, or you have something in terms of numbers? For example, from the 26th of March, you have filtered this many women in for that ballot, and, and going forward, do we have the affected the concerned women also taking positions, standing up for us for next year in 2023, representing us directly. And in terms of the, the women's quota question, what do you also have for us? When does this begin, Your Excellency? So that in the future, from today onwards, we would know that you are on our watch, um, being answerable to one two and three resolve as the largest constituency in Zimbabwe and on behalf of the welfare of the students in all of Zimbabwe I would like to ask you His Excellency what plan do you have in terms of promoting student enterprise thank you thank you Mr. President thank you very much um, and thank you for uh, the passionate uh, you know uh, confidence and belief uh, in your portfolio uh, clearly, you know, young female leaders need to be supported. People like yourself, supported in capacity building, but also more importantly supported uh, in the platforms that you get to be able to represent 
the broader you know, society of our female cadets. Uh, practical issues, parliament-wise, we have always said we are now moving away from the so-called toxic primary elections that are imposed from the top. We are moving into a community consensus process. Mm -hmm. So we are encouraging communities to make sure that they also put women first, citizens who are women and female first in terms of uh, positions in parliament, positions in the local authorities. On our own, within the citizens' movement, we are also going to make sure that representation, as I said, is actually on an equal basis so that we are able to advance the agenda. So you can begin to look at how we are going to be structured. You can also begin to look at our policies, look at our culture as we unleash them. It is actually a now thing. It's not about tomorrow or after 2023. Begin to judge us on the basis of our policies, our posture, disposition, and of course our orientation in terms of the composition. Look at how we are going to uh, present this. Now, student enterprise, of course, our duty and our obligation is to engage the students. I mean, there's always been this approach of having leaders coming to impose solutions that are not coming from those who are affected. Mm -hmm. So we want to engage you, the students. Tell us how you want us to support you mm -hmm. from a policy perspective, but also from a leadership point of mm -hmm. view, so that you are unleashed, you know, let the female leaders, let the students thrive. And they can only thrive when we give you the opportunity to shine. That's part of the transformational politics that we are talking about. Transforming how decisions are made so that it's coming from you, telling us what you want, rather than us telling you and promising you what you probably do not want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Yes, sir. Don't worry, I'm, I'm going to do my best. Just a, a quick question. I'm, I'm so sure that, we must have another session. Yes, we guy. definitely will have another session. These young people are so eager. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Advocate Fazem. For giving me this opportunity. Uh, my question is directed to our visionary, uh, yes. His Excellency, uh, President Nelson Chamis. Uh, as the youth, uh, we are more passionate about change and uh, we are ready to define, decide, and defend our future. But my question is, uh, I just want to quote Thomas Sankara. He once said, a soldier without ideological clarity yes. is a potential criminal. Mm -hmm. yes. We as the youth, we don't just want to be supporters. We mm -hmm. want to be the ambassadors mm -hmm. of citizens' action for change. Mm -hmm. What we need is that ideological clarity. We want uh, ideological school, ideological mm -hmm. classes mm -hmm. that, 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 that are initiated by citizen action for change. Mm -hmm. We want to be mentored mm -hmm. by citizen action for change leaders so that when we speak, we speak with one voice. When mm -hmm. I speak, people hear President Nelson Chamis. Mm -hmm. When my colleague speaks, people must hear President Nelson Chamis. Yes. So that's my first question. My second question, nowadays, uh, elections are now data-centric. We need data scientists. Mm. We need technology so that we can win 2023 election. Mm. Elections are not just about the outdoors, but indoor is more mm. important than outdoor. Mm. So, uh, for example, I'm doing data science and systems. Mm. We want opportunities to volunteer for the, for the party. Wow. We want opportunities Good. so that we can, uh, we can use GI, GIS technology for you, yeah. so that you can determine where to put resources. So can and, GIS make me win the presidential <laughs> Yeah. yeah, please, let's yeah. talk after this. <laughs> yeah. thank you, so thank you. we can be the ambassadors of that. So I, I, I realize that most of the students, most of people are volunteering to register people to vote, but we want to volunteer in a certain way, Powerful. and we want to, to be the ambassadors uh, of this movement. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Those are basically comments. I'll ask the president to just respond briefly to those, and then I'll take the last question. Um, Okay, one, two, three are my last one. Uh, you know, you know. Fazi, okay, okay. I, I don't no, normally protest, but uh, <laughs> the president you know, has protested, so uh, I'll just pick the man in the yellow president. That will be the last one, and then you can just well, respond. we can always create another platform. Sure. Yeah, but thank you, my brother. Very, I think, very deep questions. The first one has to do with yes. uh, having the correct, ideological. you know, ideological anchor. You're right. We don't want brainwashing. Um, we want also to equip and mentor uh, young people, young citizens, to be solid on the trajectory, on the revolutionary theory of this transformational trajectory. Uh, and I'll tell you that we've already begun a school. It's called the School of Leadership and Ideological Development, SOLID. 
So you have to be a solid cadre. You have to be a solid citizen. You have to be a solid leader, a solid MP, because you have gone through uh, the issues to do with our history as a country. We, we are building people who are able to be loyal to God, the Mecca, to be loyal to our country, its people and its resources, to also be loyal to the values that we stand for. You know, that organizational you know, posture, what you stand for, and to be able to stand for that. So that is coming. We will then also have those who are willing to be part of the leadership school. Because Africa's biggest problem is not just a problem of uh, not having uh, the, the correct politicians. It's a leadership problem. If we don't address leadership from a lower level, we'll always have problems. So leadership question has to be fixed. Like Clinton said, is the economy stupid? In Africa, in Zimbabwe, is the leadership stupid? So we have to make sure that we deal with the leadership issue so that we are able to breed leaders from students, breed leaders from young cadres, breed leaders at various levels, at church level, in communities, in the civil society. We must just have a hundred flowers blooming of leadership. So that's the first one. The second one has to do with technology. Powerful point. And in fact, it's something that we are willing to then embark on. The citizen movement and the citizen philosophy is about the citizen. Volunteers coming with their you know, various competences. We have builders come and build for change. We have farmers come and farm for change. We have thieves come and steal for change. You know? uh, so any competence you have, uh, I also know that from other areas where witches, please bewitch those who stand in the way, you know, of change. So every competence, let us volunteer for change. And thank you for your um, expertise. We really appreciate it. And I hope that um, we'll engage you and many others, you know, professionals, accountants, lawyers, engineers, you know, doctors, nurses. Let us all put our shoulders onto the block and change our country for the better. We, we, we are the best country on the African continent, but we can't assume or reclaim our number one position if we have not taken the initiative ourselves in our various competences, skills, and endowments. We are the brightest people in the world. That's why we have populated all the capitals of the world. But we have to make sure that we, we, we leverage on that competence for the benefit of our great country. Right, so all that remains, Mr. President, is for me to thank you very much. You protested. Uh, uh, the young man. The because young he's man. wearing yellow. <laughs> In fact, just give the last three, if that Okay, last you. three, President. Sure. Thank you very much for that So you can, you can almost have a fair you know, share of the thank test you. of government that we are going to have. Yeah, thank you. It's, all you know, it's always going to be about your, what you want to say. But I'm going to ask you all, keep your questions short so that we can just accommodate the other three that have been mentioned. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Mr. President, uh, the question being directed to you, I welcome all the remarks that we have been hearing. But however, uh, taking note of the keyword citizen, I have reflected on the... Um, people living with disability, and those on the street. What word is there that ensures that there is police crafting by the citizen and then police de delivery? Because we're having a case where we craft the policy as the citizens, but at the end of the day, there is paperwork that stops the police delivery. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to say about that? Well, in fact, thank you very much for what you have said. You have articulated so eloquently what is problematic about our politics. The citizen is not given the opportunity to make a decision. Let's go to those who have challenges so that they are the ones who articulate, who are able to drive policy, even its execution and implementation. I mean, look at what is happening in this country. The people who make fundamental decisions around public transport are people who don't even understand what public transport is. These are people who have private cars, who drive their own cars. They don't want to even bother to ask those who use public transport to say, is a Zupco appropriate for you? They will just say, take a Zupco. They are benefiting from that Zupco because they are the ones who did the contract. But they have not gone to the people to then ask the suitability of that public policy response or public policy intervention. It's the same thing. 
uh, for those people with disability, mm. PWD, you have to go and ask them. Because I can't pretend that I would know what the real challenge is. Because it's unique. Unique in formulation, but also unique in execution and implementation. Mm. So we must engage mm. the citizen at the center. Yes. Citizens who are in those unfortunate circumstances are the ones who must give us the police prescription. Thank you. Yes, so you're wearing red, but I'll allow you. <laughs> I, think, I think you're colorblind. You know that? That, that's not red. Okay, it's pink. I know no, you don't fine. like red, but no, that's not red. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, my question is, we've, had, we've heard a lot about CCC and the Citizens' College for Change, but I think the citizens also want to know why they should vote for you at a personal level, not just about the Citizens' Coalition, sure. but you as an individual. What makes you the right candidate for this particular job? Do, do you also doubt that I'm the right candidate? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. And I did say that to intimidate you. But, <laughs> but just to, to, to say that, thank you for that very kind question. Uh, I, I think when people are voting, they are not voting for personalities. They are voting for values. And I would say that the contest between myself and others, Mr. Mnangagwa included, is actually a contest between values. Mm. And I think you know the values I stand for. Clear, clean, accountability, no corruption, democracy, giving citizens their respectful place, their dignity, their responsibility and authority, allowing people to have their way and say, that is what makes us different. I mean, one thing I can assure you, and why you should vote for us, is that when Mr. Mnangagwa and his party become opposition, we will never deploy the police against them. We will never use riot police when they demonstrate, when they hold their rallies, they will be free to hold their rallies. When they attack us, they will not be in prison for attacking us. That we assure you. We will never hire, you know, tear smoke or canisters or order, you know, button sticks against human beings. That will not happen. There will be freedom, there will be justice. You can be sure that as students, you will have an opportunity to also enjoy not just academic freedom, but the autonomy you know, of tertiary institutions so that you are able to have intellectual inquiry in an environment where you are free, where you are able to exercise your intellectual talents. That we can assure you. You will also be able to have education not being the preserve of a few who are rich. It will be accessible to all. Just like what was done during the Smith regime, and most of these leaders have benefited from the loans and grants, you know, before. That is what we must go back to, so that education does not become a privilege and a commodity. It must be available to all. I understand it. Being a rural boy, I'm a rural boy who has now been a city boy. I understand the transition. So yes, that will help to also help those uh, who are in circumstances of need. Thank you. Now. Okay, I'm going to just take one more. Just one more. I'm sure you had picked on him okay. to be the last one. That's okay. Mr. The President has spoken. <laughs> oh, oh, no, you had picked. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Go see. But part of the duty of the President is also it's correct to citizens, Absolutely. citizens who are mistaken. This is true. Thank you very much for the correction, Mr. President. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mine is just a question that is more like a concern that I know is, is perverted the minds of a lot of people. Uh, citizens, in fact, what are you doing, Comrade Presidents, uh, to ensure that you ameliorate the issue to do with double candidature? I still remember the last time sure. at a press conference when the spokesperson is addressed, uh, she was very sure that the issue and the problem was going to be addressed. But up until this time, we are hearing a lot of things that are coming in. I may not be willing to understand the the basis upon which sure. uh, that uh, problem emanated from, but maybe how are you going to address the problem? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Brilliant question. Thank you very much. And I know that is, is, is nagging a lot of people. Mm. Yes. I, I get it in my uh, inbox. My inbox, my DM. People keep asking, Mr. President, why is it like this? You know, uh, you must understand two problems. First one, old habits die hard. You know, we're a new movement, 
but there are other people who are trying to import their old habits into the new movement. Uh, and these people are a dangerous lot. We are doing everything within our power to make sure that either they exercise and take off their old habits or we discard them. Mm. So that is the first thing because you know that when you start something new, you have a new vehicle. People still want to jump onto that vehicle to contaminate it. Mm. So we are very conscious of that. That is the first problem. But the second problem also has to do with us being a new kid on the block. We still have teething problems, you know, uh, because we are so loved and people are so willing to represent this uh, new baby uh, in parliament, in local authorities. There's always going to be that kind of, uh, you know, glitches administratively and technically, as has been the case. But there is an issue that we are dealing with. But going forward, I've also said, look, uh, once beaten, twice shy. And I've learned my lessons as a leader. If I'm still the leader, because you know, the citizen movement has to choose the leader, ultimately. Uh, if I'm still the leader, we'll have to make sure that we centralize the issue of uh, who signs for the people who then become candidates. Uh, and surely one person can't sign for double candidates. What caused problems that we have too many people signing? Like we had four people who were signing, uh, some now sign because, you know, of proximity, familiarity, history, and other things. So those are some of the things we are trying to really flush out. It's not a walk in the park. Uh, it's not a, a, an instant coffee kind of thing. It's a very tough call. But I can tell you that you will not see the, the kind of problems. And you know that the buck stops with the leader. And that we are sure is a very concerning but we did very well. I mean, you look at all the seats that were there, uh, it was just two constituencies or two seats, what seats for that matter, where we had challenges. But it's something that we are dealing with. And I've told the leaders who are responsible to deal with the issue and to make sure that uh, at times you don't wash your debt linen in public. Uh, but I can tell you that the, 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 the debt linen is being washed, uh, but in private. And what we give you is obviously the clean linen. Thank you. Mr. President, I think I speak on behalf of all the young people here and all the people who've joined us thank online uh, in saying thank you very much. Thank this you. has been a fruitful conversation. We strongly hope as the, the people who believe in the movement and who want to champion the cause of citizen participation, citizen sure. engagement and citizen leadership, that this will be the first of many. Um, and you will continue to put us, the citizens, first uh, in terms of your engagement. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for the address. And I believe it behoves us all as young people, as citizens, to play our part. It's not a question of throwing uh, President Chamisa in the front of an army tank to save Zimbabwe. It's really uh, the responsibility of each and every one of us to stand up, to ask the tough questions, to speak, and most importantly, to act for change in 2022. Good evening, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.